This podcast contains factual information only. It is intended for professional financial advisors and does not contain any personal financial advice. You should not make any investment, insurance or financial decisions based on the content of this podcast. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. PlutoSoft is a comprehensive financial planning software and CRM program. It covers every part of the advice process, fact-finding, strategy modeling, portfolio management, life insurance, SOA, and report generation. Plus, it includes workflow management and a client hub portal. PlutoSoft helps financial planning firms produce high-quality advice in a fraction of the time and has an extensive range of platform data feeds. As the industry's complete all-in-one solution, PlutoSoft has helped rocket fuel the success of leading financial planning firms around Australia. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm pumped to be here with Troy McMillan. Troy's uh, joining us from the lovely West Coast. He's the uh, the Chief Executive Founder and uh, still a practicing advisor at The Wealth Designers. He, he started that business from scratch back in 2009 with a with a dream and a prayer and a, an assistant and uh you know the the rest is history troy thanks for joining us buddy thanks ben good to be here man thanks for inviting me on oh mate it's great to chat you guys have been at it for a while and i was just chatting to you and when we were talking before firing up the camera here that uh when i kicked off my business uh six and a half years ago or so that your company was one of the ones that i looked at in terms of what businesses were doing things that were aligned with you know the, where we wanted to be playing so um, yeah, it's great to be chatting. I'm I'm keen to talk a bit about you know the the story and the journey. Obviously, you've been at it for a bit over a decade. You know what's changed, what hasn't changed, um, yep. and, and and pick your brain so I can selfishly uh, you know get a few tips for myself, mate. So maybe that's a good place to start. Like so maybe talk us through the evolution of the business and how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, sure. Look, it has been a long evolution. I mean, it goes back 20 odd years ago now. I was working overseas. I was working in investments, initially trained as an accountant. Uh, and I came back to Australia and I wanted to stay in Perth because I had some um, family members who went well and didn't want to go over to the East Coast. So I thought, what am I going to do um, that's not you know, investment related that's in Perth? And then found financial advice. And back then, like 20 years ago, I mean, there wasn't a lot of options. So I worked in the bank uh, initially and Spent two years in the bank, one year understanding what financial advice is all about, and the second year sort of planning my exit. So creating a business plan, how I thought I could deliver it differently because, to be really honest, I mean, it's no secret to anyone. I mean, the way advice was delivered back then was just really surprising to me. You know, coming back from overseas, the way it was sold and the commissions and all that part. So I thought, mate, there had to be a better way. Um, so my, my planning process took that year and I started the business back in 2000 and or into 2002 2003 with a, another partner but even in those early days we still didn't I didn't feel like we really captured a different process I felt like we we're still doing pretty much what we're doing in the bank but just probably a little bit more enthusiasm uh, it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't until I, I didn't give up I kept sort of looking what there must be an, a better approach I just couldn't find it but I did find it overseas and I found it with Bill Baccarat which I guess many people would know now but Back then in 2002, sort of 2003, Bill was quite unknown to Australia and I had some initial chats with him uh, over there. He invited me over to San Diego and I spent a, a couple of trips flying over to San Diego with a lot of vigour around how I could actually understand uh, a different approach uh, to advice. And that's what sort of got me, that, that, I guess that changed my mindset. Uh, I knew there was a different approach. And it wasn't too long after that that Bill started coming to Australia and they sort of teamed up with Jim Stackpool, who a lot of people would know as well. And I guess I was really fortunate to have formed a really great relationship with Jim back in those early days, 2005. And uh, I think I engaged him professionally in 2006 to help with 
um, our engagement process. And to be really honest, that was our engagement process has not changed uh, since 2006, where we, we, we price on value. We have uh, 12 monthly engagements with our clients. Uh, and then in 2009, when I started the Wealth Designers, that was the line in the sand moment where everything we're going to do from that point in time was going to be different. So essentially, the business approach and the advice process hasn't changed at all, Ben, since that time. That's amazing. And I know that you're, you're no commission, um, no asset-based fees, no product fees, which yeah. I think is it, that's the way that we do things as well. So obviously, my totally biased opinion, it's, um, you know, it's the way that we find it's best for us. I know that there's a lot of different ways to be right with, with that sort of stuff. But uh, I think it's fair to say that it's increasing, um, increasingly common today. But, uh, you know, 13 years ago, um, probably it probably would have been one of the few. I still saying that we're like one of the 1% of companies that don't take commissions, whereas you would have been in the 0.1 of a percent, I'd imagine, <laughs> um, back then. How, how did you go about, uh, you know, I suppose coming or getting to that point and then, coming up with a, that value-based model at a time where it really was pretty uncommon. Yeah, there were some nervous moments, I can tell you, like starting a business again from scratch with a completely different advice model than what was being used before. Um, I look back now and I think gee, that was <laughs> maybe I was younger and braver, but it was, a, it was a big leap, but it was one we've never, ever looked back from from the moment we made it. And it didn't take too long from having new client engagements where we could understand that it was just working. It made a lot of sense, not just to me, but it made sense to the client. It made sense to our referral partners. And you know, our referral partners have always been our lifeline. We've done very well with engaging professional relationships. So it was working on all levels. But with the uh, with the client engagement, and it was, you know, everyone's you know, obviously seen Simon Sinek and read the book and the whole thing positioning around why, and that was really powerful at the time. So we did focus a lot on why the client was engaging us. And to be probably honest, like before that time, when I sat down with clients, a lot of it was based on what I could do for the client. Like I came from an accounting background, an investment banking background. So I thought then that all this skill that I had was of real value to the client. And of course it was, but it wasn't really why the clients were engaging myself or my firm at that time. So by flipping it around and going back to the client around why they were engaging, what was most important to them, having much deeper conversations with the clients back then, which we still do today, mm. crafting out our skill set on how to have those deep conversations. Because you know, we all know clients don't come in <laughs> ready and armed to have these deep conversations. You have to really guide them through it. And you know, that's something the wealth designers now is very good at. And all the advisors, we spend a lot of time making sure that that skill uh, is always improving. But uh, have those deep conversations to get there wide, understand uh, what's most important, the outcomes that they want to achieve. And then once we knew that, then we could work out you know, what advice we could deliver that was going to help them achieve those outcomes and what services were going to be most valuable uh, to the clients for that 12-month period. So we could price it you know, pretty easily. So it was priced on value, but also priced on financial complexity uh, as well. And we deliver that in the engagement model and... To be honest, like it's never really, we, we don't have too many problems engaging clients that way. We never have, which is why we've continued on with it for such a long time. Mm, absolutely. And I'm keen to selfishly pick your brain on that because I was just saying that we've just switched these 12 month uh, fixed term agreements, which we did in the 1st of July last year. So we're just coming up for our renewals and I'm, I'm keen for some tips. But um, before we talk about that, I'm keen to to talk a little bit more about the the values um, values based financial planning or the actual practical um, process from the the Bill Bacharach stuff. And you say mm. get to the why. And like I read that book. It was I I read it. You know, I, I didn't even know when. It was like almost a decade ago, uh, possibly. Um, yep. but, and I think it makes a lot of sense, but you've been doing it for more than a decade, um, in business. And it's one of the things that hasn't changed. So I'm keen to hear from someone that's been, you know, at it for, for such a long time. How you mentioned that your the people come in and they're probably not, you know, uh, or when people approach you that they're not maybe ready to have those deeper conversations. 
how do you get them there? Like, what are the actual steps that you go through yep. in your new, you know, call it a prospect process or engagement yes. process or whatever to get them to the point where they do start unpacking some of their, you know, their deeper feelings and drivers to help you help them? So what, what I've found, I mean, having those conversations came pretty easy to me. It's just my natural personality. So I found it okay, but as I started bringing on really great advisors to the business, it was one part. Of course, you know, everyone learns technical skills. Very few have got the soft skills to feel comfortable in asking clients sort of those deeper, more meaningful type questions. So I was trying to build a framework from what Bill would give me, from what Jim was working in the office. But you know what, what worked the best? And the, what worked the best was just giving the client more heads up around what to expect in that first meeting. It sounds simple. But mm. something we never we never did in those early days. So today our process is when clients first come to us, they have a 15-minute um, consult call. And in that 15 minutes, it's a bit of a fact-finding mission between you know, the advisor and the, the clients. But at the very end, we, we tell them exactly what to expect in that first meeting. So they're like, they do get the heads up. So they know the first part of the meeting is going to be all about them. And they're going to have time individually and then collectively to tell us what's most important to them, uh, what are the outcomes that they really want to achieve, and you know what, you know what the purpose is of them achieving it, and how and how they'll be feeling around the attainment of those outcomes. So they sort of know there's going to go a little bit deeper at the at the start, and mm. we sort of make it make it lighthearted. We don't we have a bit of a laugh about it, so clients understand they they know exactly what the first part of the meeting is going to be. Uh, and then I know the second part is going to be more financially driven. Then we're going to go through the information they've already given us. We get everything up front so, because we know in that first meeting, majority of time we want to spend is having these deeper conversations and getting, mm-hmm. get, getting the answer because we know, Ben, that the answers they give us is really the reason why they're going to be paying advice fees every year. And if, unless we get those answers from them, it's going to be quite surface. I mean, that's, and not there's not a lot of substantiation around you know, the fees and the value attached to the fees. So mm. I would recommend anyone, if you're going to go down that model, it's really, you know, that softly positioning it with the clients before they come to the office. So they, so they don't get that. They look at you like, oh, am I in a psych meeting or something? What, I, yeah. I wasn't expect, you know, I wasn't expecting these, um, these questions because that's what we used to hear. And for a lot of the advisors back then, they used to freeze and they go, oh, and they go straight to the financial part. Um, yeah. But look, nowadays our advisors have you know, become really good at it. They know to <clears throat> put the pen down, let the client speak. It's all about the client speaking and we're just there to help guide them through the questions. And do you know what? Some of the, some of the meetings we have with clients are incredibly liberating. Yeah, you get people occasionally, you know, there's tears. Um, one yeah. of our advisors, Kara, always keeps a box of tissues to the side. Uh, yeah. Because the clients are having conversations. Generally, they don't have between themselves if it's a couple. Um, they don't often yeah. talk about things like this. So mm. there's a lot of aha moments we find. And you know what? After a good discovery meeting, you come out and you pretty much know that you're going to form a good working relationship with those clients. Yeah, great. I um, I did try it actually for for a few meetings, but I found that, and it's it's probably was my delivery more than the actual clients. But I found that mm. they really had never been asked those questions before <laughs> and weren't. Um, but, oh, I don't know. Never really thought about it. I even struggled with the like, what does a great result look like to, when it comes to your money? And people were like, mm. oh, haven't thought about it. And I sort of think, well. Great, but like, what were you thinking when you walk into the financial planner's office to have a conversation with them? They what just, they just haven't thought of it. Yeah, yeah, they exactly. haven't thought so, about it. And so that's why look, the more we become better at guiding them through it, uh, and look, we we do a lot of practice in it as a group too. You know, we quite often practice these sorts of meetings and come up with different challenges and things, and it's just so the advisors are sort of prepared for what hmm. may come out. And look, and, and it's also respecting that they're also not for everyone. You know, if yeah. you get a couple of um being over in um, Perth, you know, a couple of engineers who are married who come into a meeting, quite often, I don't want to stir it up, but they don't want to have those comments. They just want to go straight to the financials. And you know, <laughs> just re- respecting that and you know that and you will, you'll park it to the side. You don't want to keep pushing it too hard and you know that yeah. that's not really for them. But in all honesty, in my experience, I reckon nine out of 10 clients would have a really great discovery and it really does set the, the foundation for a great relationship with them going forward. Because it's something we can go back to and explain to them, look, remember what was important to you back two years ago, you know, or 12 months yeah. ago, you know, it seems like that's changed and 
tell us you know, what value are you placing right now? What priority do you place on that? And what's the, what's the significance of that now to you? Uh, we captured some really, really great stuff in that first meeting. And does that tie into the re-engagement piece? Because you mentioned yeah, you got your 12 agreements and then, then and then obviously the importance of really nailing it with with that yep. to get people re- renewed and have continuity of revenue and relationships as well. Yep. Um, yes. Maybe, yeah, talk us it through look at, that. It really does because we feel like we've got a really good scope of work uh, to deliver in that first 12 months, but prioritise what we're going to deliver for them and we know the value of what that's going to achieve for them. So at the end of the 12 months, we'll be sitting down for the re-engagement. Yeah, well, the, we always say to the client, look, in 12 months' time, the reason we're doing 12 months' fees is because we don't understand what challenges you're going to face next year. We don't know what sort of financial complexities you're going to have. And we also don't really know what's going to be most important to you then. We know what's most important to you now. So we're going to focus on what we can deliver to you over the 12 months. So you can imagine when we had that next meeting, you know, 12 months down the track, again, they're very open to the conversation because they've already had it before. And look, if nothing has changed much around what's most important to them, well, then that, you know, it goes a lot quicker. But quite often, as we know, people, things have changed and they might have mm. new priorities around what's most important. And there's life events that happen. Hey, I mean, you know, COVID happened, right? Like there's, yeah. there's a war, there's, there's all sorts of things happening. And we've found in this last couple of years that it's reset a lot. And I'm sure I'm not the only person or the only advice to say that it's reset a lot around what's most important to people, you know, for their families and so on. So we're having re-engagement conversations, you know, currently where quite a lot has changed from what was important to them previously. And as a result of knowing what's changed, we're realigning the advice on what's now of value to them compared to what was of value to them a year ago or two years ago. The re-engagement conversation is just as important as the engagement conversation and it does, does align the scope of our services for the next 12 months. And the clients, again, really understand you know, how the fees work. They understand that the scope of services have increased and we can add more value, that the fees are going to increase. They also know it's quite refreshing that if our scope of services have decreased because we can't add as much value, that the fees are going to decrease. Mm. And it's, again, Ben, it's just, it's just it's got to make sense. If it makes sense to us, it's going to make sense to the clients. And like I said before, it also makes sense to the professional partners who are referring these clients through to us. Uh, so it's just a model that, again, for us, it's quite a mature model now and it, it works really well for, for our team. You mentioned when we were chatting just before um, that you focus on collecting the right data at the, at the right time in, in that process to equip you guys to have those conversations, uh, you know, as effectively as possible. What have yep. you found is is most Im- important there, particularly around the the renewals and what goes into it before you you actually have that conversation with your client? As in regards to the initial, say, 15-minute chat and so on? Or when we actually so have when people are coming meeting, up so. for their tw- when people are coming up for their 12-month renewal, you were talking about something about, like, getting the right um, information back from them about their, maybe it's their goals or what's going on with their money. Is that... Yeah, so again, we will have the, the re-engagement conversation personally with them again, which is making sure that making sure has anything changed around what's most important to them. And I mean, these are quite deep conversations. We're not just doing surface level goals and so on. We're actually going into quite um, aspirations, hopes and dreams. We're getting what we call signature outcomes um, from the clients, which are outcomes that you know, we couldn't just make up. They're not surface driven at all. They're really, they've had to come from the clients. Uh, little little things, you know, it's just around perhaps you know, the actual name of the little town in Italy that they want to go to and the reasons why they want to go there. And it's, they had one last week where, you know, the, the, one of the clients wants to go back to Vasso, I think it is, in Italy uh, to see her nine-year-old grandmother, you know. it was And it was such a strong thing. And, of course, she hadn't been able to get back there for two and a half years. And we talk about tears. That was a, a real tear moment she wanted to make sure that they had the financial certainty that, that she could do this sort of trip and and not just do it once she wants to continue to do it of course because she's worried that one day you know her grandmother's gonna pass away and she wouldn't have seen her so mm. it's it's really recapturing that information again ensuring that we're aligned to what's most important and um that it's still whatever we're doing is still of value to the clients love it and so you've talked there a bit about the a, a few of the things that haven't changed. What are the things that have changed over the 
over the time that you've been in business? What have been the biggest shifts for you guys? Uh, I think we're always changing. Like there's been changes to our advice process, which has continued to change and mainly through technology and so on. I always say to my team, like it's, there's no point just being comfortable because if we're just comfortable, we're never going to grow. So we have to be comfortable with change um, and embracing new technology. Uh, so there's been a lot of technical change uh, to try and make our process more effective. I guess you know, when we started, I mentioned you before, there was only the two of us. And as we sort of grew in those early days, a lot of the work we were doing was manual because we didn't really have a, uh, I guess, a, a manual to go by. We weren't aligned to any institutions. We didn't have any big corporates helping us. So a lot of the stuff we had to figure out for ourselves if we wanted to remain different. Uh, what that meant, though, once we started getting a bit of scal scalability to the business, you know, doing things manual, as you would know, it's not the most effective way and it doesn't really build efficient no. solutions. So I think, you know, we've been constantly trying to make that process quicker and easier, not just for us, but also for our clients. So there's been a, a big push around um, technical change. Uh, the other part, you know, as you grow internally, you know, our corporate structure needed to change as well. And we've had to have many changes to that, making sure that it's all aligned and there's proper reporting lines and everyone knows their roles and responsibilities and no one's stepping on each other's toes. Because again, back in the old days, you know, someone might do two or three or four different types of things because everyone chips in and helps. But again, mm. as you grow as a business, you can't, you can't be unclear around what people are doing uh, in the office. So it has to be quite clear and documented. And there has to be, you know, the OKRs, objectives and key results to every role. And everyone's going to be performing to those. So the corporate structure has been quite important. And that's been a big change, uh, I guess, for us over the time. The other thing, and I may have mentioned this when we were chatting before, is yeah, I guess the way we're viewed with clients, I think, has changed too. Like, I think going back a few years with our brand and so on, it was, I mean, wealth changed, right? I mean, the whole way people view wealth has changed. And that was a big thing that I noticed through COVID. Um, yeah, billionaires wear sneakers. I mean, we all hear that. We, we know that. Uh, yeah. You know, it's true. Like, so I, I felt like our branding back when a few years ago was more that traditional uh, wealth management type branding. Uh, which didn't seem to f see relevant in the world we're currently in. So we've, again, tried to make ourselves more approachable because the way we see clients, we don't just take on ultra high net worth. We, we have those clients in part of our business, but we want to have an advice model that appeals to all Australians. So we want people just starting their wealth journey, those of more financial complexity, right through to these wealthy families who, again, have significant wealth. So, you know, how do you do that from a branding perspective? Uh, I think it's become easier. Again, with this with the shift through COVID. And so mm. I guess the biggest change we've had recently is the rebrand, repositioning our, ourselves to become more approachable and uh, we're still trusted uh, and professional. The real question is, though, are you wearing sneakers to the office? <laughs> Today I've, I've got um, loafers. How's that? <laughs> we're getting closer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> nah, look, on Fridays we're pretty relaxed in the office and... Um, it's pretty much that the dress code is comfortable. Uh, everyone's got a different interpretation of, <laughs> of comfortable. Um, totally. But, and again, client, we still see clients on a Friday and not one person's ever said anything. I think people are really now, are, yeah, more than happy with it. We haven't worn ties now for, I think, four years. And there was mm. a time when I, I thought we'd never not wear ties because that's what you do, right? But can't even imagine yeah. that anymore. But, yeah, we're still professional. So... Totally. I think yeah. that the I think that the COVID bunker lifestyle has really yep. shown that people are humans because everyone 100%. was dealing with you know you got kids, um, you know daycares closed, schools closed, yep. like you and you you couldn't you couldn't not get some insight into people that you're dealing with, and now it's just you know you get a kid that starts screaming on a Zoom that in the background like that's oh. just normal. Whereas yeah, normal. Whereas before like. Prior to COVID, that would actually be a bit of a um, and an issue or something that you'd start to have a little mini panic about. I think as, uh, I, as I reckon it's it's been a really good thing. Yeah, I think it's changed, and I think people are really comfortable now. Mm. The way we and I think know, it ties in with that with what you were saying there about like really we know that money is people are um, trying to get to they, they want mo more money but they want it for the why for the things that it will yeah. do and it's it's about their life so I think mm. that the fact that they know that you're a person you know that they're a person like 
that's just going to make it easier that you do the dance and and help people yep. with, with that stuff because it's not just all about spreadsheets and pie graphs, right? It's 100%. And again, going back to COVID, I think, I honestly think that our engagement conversations are even more, are even deeper now post, post COVID or during COVID. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, um, people are really up to talking about it now. Totally. What's, uh, what's on the radar for you, Troy? What's your, what are you guys focused on at the moment? What's coming up? Uh, look, the big thing for us is again, we never take our eyes off, um, technology. So we're trying to, um, We've just embraced a whole lot of new tech into the office, so we've got some more to roll out as well. Um, again, just to try and make the whole advice process more more efficient. So uh, that's been that's been great, and I can already see the benefits of doing that. And we have, just have to keep adapting and changing to what what's available. Um, so that's a big part. Like I can mention the rebrand has been big, but our focus is on building um, a great business that delivers you know quality, trusted advice. So. To do that effectively and to have the national expansion, we've got an office in Sydney. Um, so it's great to have the East Coast and West Coast. But our real goal is to have a boutique office in all capital cities. That's what we want to achieve. And the only way we can do that is by focusing on technology. Um, I guess when we moved to Sydney, that was a bit of a wake-up call. We realised that someone on the East Coast, if they couldn't effectively use our processes because we're on the mm. West Coast, it was going to just slow the whole thing down. So it's really great that that was sort of a nice way to start. And we learned a lot from that. So I guess with the technology that we're bringing in now, that's going to overcome that. And it really shouldn't matter where anyone works around Australia. Um, they should be able to tap into the advice process that we've built mm. and be able to deliver you know, valuable advice to as many Australians as they can. And how do you tackle your tech decisions when it comes to changing or new things? Because I know that, it, you know, you've got um, 40 plus people in your business. Yes. It's, it's a big deal to make those those changes. It's not like just flicking a switch. How, how, how do, you, do you give someone responsibility for that? Yeah. Or does that come with you? Yeah. No, again, that was, that was probably a painful lesson to learn. We could be here all day if you want to hear the painful lessons. There's quite a few of those. <laughs> um, so we, we didn't have someone in the office who was the tech person. We had a lot of people who knew bits, bits and pieces of it and everyone sort of played a part. But what we learned was that didn't work. You need to have someone who owns tech, who understands, who can implement it, who can also manage it properly to make sure that it's effective across the whole business uh, and ensuring that it's delivering the solutions that we want. So we now have that person and that person also has consultants that they deal with and ensure that they can also get the best information at all times. Uh, and it's then run across our senior management team and, and all the different divisions to make sure that it's working in each, each location in the business. And that's been a game changer since we have that trusted person who's at the top of the game in the tech mm. space. And I, I always say, look, that, that person also in the future doesn't even have to come from uh, financial advice. Like it's, it mm. can, I had this when we had a day recently with the team. I said, well, look, if Elon Musk was running our business, you know, what would he do different? You know, and yeah. the reason I asked that, because seriously, let's, let's think outside of us and let's think, let's look what other businesses are doing. Yeah. So let, what, what new, what, what crazy ideas could we think about could be put into advice that could actually work? Because, you know, years ago, I mean, some of the things that were happening now, you wouldn't even imagine. So, you know, I'm mm. sort of imagining that person, our business could even be that sort of person who's just, completely things outside the square from a tech um, point of view that could deliver really great solutions to our world to make the advice delivery even easier uh, to clients. And it's all about the client experience, right? So if we can continually make the client experience better and better, I think Mm. that's got to be what we focus on. Yeah, I think that as we, uh, as advice um, uh, evolves further, I see it where we've got, you've got, you need obviously your technical advice specialists that are intimate with advice and understand, you know, all of the compliance mm. regs and all of those sorts of things. But it's almost like they become a, a, a function within the business. And then for the other roles, the, it be, it's actually becoming less relevant that those roles yep. have necessarily deep backgrounds in um, that in that space. I know that we when we've looked at our marketing I actually see it as a huge advantage that they don't have experience yep. in financial yep. services because it's something that historically we just haven't done that well. And I think when you come with those preconceptions that sometimes it can blind you to things that make a lot of sense and we're not really competing with um, 
you know, I'm not competing with you for business. I'm competing with Amazon for business or exactly um, right. you know, Facebook and Uber and all of these companies that have such slick user experience because they've got the psychologists and the consultants and the tech people and the engineers that, um, you know, make it hook us in and um, make it seamless. So it's uh, true. Like um, with our, um, we sort of have marketing team as well, again, who haven't come from um, within advice and, the person who sort of heads up our communications, you know, no background at all in financial class. But when, when she first joined the team a couple of years ago, she couldn't even believe the language that we were using in some of the ways of methods that went out to clients and new clients. And you know what? Yeah. It, was, it was an aha moment where I sort of realised, yeah, that probably doesn't sound the sort of language we should be using. And I think a lot of us, um, particularly if you're coming from the big institutional world, have just got used to talking in a certain way that made sense yeah. to us. But... If you're a normal Australian or, you know, looking for advice, it, it just didn't seem to be that approachable. So we've made, made a really conscious effort now with all our communications to be make it in, in, in a way where people can totally understand what you're saying and be delivered in a way that just makes sense to them. Absolutely. And I think it's great for, I think that goes a long way to getting consumers more behind advice yep. because they understand what's up and actually it's not just that they trust you or that they trust me it's that they yes. un- they trust the process of financial yes. advice and they understand the outcomes um troy r- really appreciate you sharing your insights there mate you guys are up to some great stuff so keep fighting the good fight tell me my last question for you is mm. if you could go back uh one back clock to 2009 and you're just about to uh you know, put up the shingle, what would be your one piece of advice to yourself back then? I think that the biggest thing I would tell myself then is to not have the business grow quicker than what the back office can um, keep up with. Because, <laughs> again, that, that's been the, the pain points of the business. It really has. You know, it's been great leading a business that's grown over the time and I'm very proud of that. But along the journey not just at the beginning, been pretty much along the entire journey and probably until recently, in the back office had never been able to keep up with the growth of what was coming for the front office. Mm. And as you would know with it, I mean, there's just pain points all the way through the, the advice process and the, the, the team internally. Mm. Uh, so I think what I would do, I would slow it down to ensure that those two things are in sync a little bit more and we've found a solution for growth, you know, back office wise with our processes mm. before that next stage of growth occurred um you obviously look very ambitious at the start and it was all great to to grow the business but it was really yeah, it was a, some tough lessons learned there yeah for, totally, yeah. Yeah, for the team as <laughs> yeah. well um but i think you go too much either way it's uh it's painful That's right. so finding that finding that ideal balance is uh, is tricky but uh, yep. yeah would, it's uh good thinking but like I said, if we've talked about painful lessons, we could have another podcast. Go take a look. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a few. Totally. Well, that can be the next one. <laughs> yeah, mate. Thanks so much for having me today. It's been great. It's good to chat. That's all right. Really appreciate you sharing your insights, mate. We'll catch you next time. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben.